In this lesson, we will learn about SAS. SAS is a CSS extension language. I will explain what that means in just a moment, but first I must point out that SAS is not an official part of CSS. This means that you do not need to learn SAS. So if at any point during this lesson, you decide that SAS is not for you, you don't like it, you don't want to deal with it, you don't want to learn about it, that's absolutely okay. However, I feel that you would be doing yourself a disservice if you didn't at least stick around and watch this lesson to see what all the fuss is about. So throughout this course, you've been learning about CSS. And I would assume that at some point throughout the course, you've had the following thought in the back of your mind. CSS, I love you because you let me style content however I want. But CSS, I also hate you. Why do you make me repeat myself so often? Why can't you remember the color values that I want to use? Why can't you remember anything? Why don't you, as a computer language, offer me, the coder, tools to stay flexible and dynamic? Well, you're not alone. We've all had that thought in the back of our mind. And SAS is the result of some of the web's brightest minds coming together and creating an extension language for CSS that resolves all of those issues and limitations with CSS that I was just complaining about. So the question becomes, well, what exactly is SAS? What is an extension language? To answer those questions, let's look at a few drawings. We, as web developers and designers, write CSS code because it's our way of adding style to pages and applications. Now, we don't write CSS code because it's our favorite language in the world. We write CSS code to make the web browser happy even at the expense of our own happiness. <laughs> because as we've pointed out, CSS from a coding perspective has its own set of limitations or weaknesses or common points of frustration. Now to circumvent those limitations, we could try to invent our own style sheet language or our own syntax, but that wouldn't change the fact that web browsers still need traditional CSS code. So if we tried to invent our own syntax, we would be happy because coding would be more enjoyable, but the web browser would just sit in the corner with a sad look on its face, unable to add any style to the page. So this is where SAS comes into play. The brilliant minds behind SAS invented their own style sheet syntax. Now if we use this new syntax and try to pass it directly into the web browser, the web browser won't understand it and none of the content will be styled. So again, we will be happy because the code is more enjoyable to write, but the browser will still be sad. But the great minds behind SAS did not stop there. They invented a syntax and then they created a compiler that takes the SAS code, the SAS syntax, and converts it into regular CSS that can be passed on to the web browser. So the web browser is happy and so are we because the code is much more enjoyable to write. So our goal for this lesson is to familiarize ourselves with SAS syntax and get a feel for the extension language's basic features. Now, in order for you to follow along during the lesson or directly after the lesson, you'll need to get your hands on the middleman, the SAS compiler, the tool that takes SAS syntax and magically converts it into regular CSS. Now, if you want fast, immediate gratification, perform a web search for SAS Meister or CodePen. These are web applications and you can write SAS code directly in the browser and then it will spit back the traditional CSS code for you. If you want a bit more of a robust solution and you want to install the SAS compiler on your local computer, I suggest you perform a web search for Koala SAS or Scout SAS. So with the logistics out of the way, let's dive right in. Here we are in the web browser, this is an example page, and it does not have any CSS styling applied to it yet. At this point, it is pure, raw HTML. So in the code for this page, we can see that just like in every other lesson in the course, we are linking to a CSS file that lives within a folder named CSS, and the file is named screen.css. So here is the folder where the HTML page lives, here is the CSS folder. Here is the screen.css file. Now currently this file is empty. There's not an ounce of CSS code in it. 
Now we can see in this folder there's an additional file named screen.scss. This file extension stands for sassy CSS. So in this lesson, we will be writing SAS code within this file. And every time we save our progress, the middleman SAS compiler that is running in the background on my computer will detect the save and then take a mental snapshot of our SAS code, convert it into regular CSS, and export that output into this screen.css file. So that way, we still have a traditional CSS file we can pass along to the web browser. OK, so here we are in the text editor. On the left side of the screen is the sassy.css file. It's currently empty. And I want to begin by showing you that sassy CSS is completely backwards compatible with normal CSS. So we can write a bit of normal code like body, font family, Helvetica, sans serif. And if I save, we see on the right side of the screen that the normal .css file is automatically provided a copy of whatever we typed in our sassy CSS file. So that is the middleman SAS compiler in the background doing its job. So if we head over to the web browser and refresh, we can see that the font Helvetica is being used. But that wasn't a very exciting change because that was just standard CSS. Let's try our first taste of SAS syntax. So let's imagine that we want to define a color scheme for this page. Let's imagine that we've identified this shade of orange as the primary color for our palette. So let's begin by applying that orange color to all links on the page. So if we weren't using SAS, we would simply say A to select the anchor elements, color, and then paste in the hexadecimal color code. Now you know we're going to need that color value again somewhere else in our style sheet. And there's no sense in trying to search for it or memorize it. So instead, I'm going to delete the reference to the color there. And at the very top of the style sheet, I'm going to use the dollar sign and say primary color colon and then paste in the hexadecimal color code. So I just created a variable. We can't create variables in normal CSS, but we can in SAS. Now, for those of you that have not used a programming language in the past, a variable in this context is just a code name for this value. So now we can reference this hexadecimal color code by simply saying primary color. So in this rule for links, you can say color should use primary color. So if I save, we see that the SAS compiler converted this code into this. So if we load the web page and refresh, we can see all of our links are now orange. So the key concept here is that there's no need to repeat ourselves as coders. If we know that we are going to use a value more than once, let's define it as a variable. Before we move on, I want to point out that there's nothing special about the phrase primary color. It doesn't have any inherent meaning. I made it up. You could choose any name for your variable that you would like. So for example, instead of primary color, I could name this beautiful hue. And then in the rule for our link color, I would use that phrase again, beautiful hue. So it doesn't matter what you choose for your variable names. The whole idea is that we're only defining our values once. And then we use the variable name throughout the rest of our style sheet. So that's the first feature of SAS, the ability to create and use variables. Let's move on to the next feature, which is called nesting. In order to see nesting in action, let's give ourselves a goal. Let's imagine that we want to style this navigation in the header to look like a traditional horizontal navigation menu. So in our HTML code, we can see that the navigation menu is nothing more than a nav element with an unordered list and then list items with a link inside each item. And this nav element lives within the header that has a class of site header. So in our CSS, we'll use a class of site header and then target the nav element. So the first thing we'll do is target the unordered list element and remove any padding or margin that it may have. 
Next, we want to target the list items and remove their bullets. So list style none. Let's also float the list items to the left so that they all sit on one horizontal line. Now, before we go any further, I want to point out that without SAS, this code is absolutely absurd. This is not valid CSS. You cannot nest one rule inside another rule, but we can with SAS. So nesting like this offers two primary benefits. Number one, it helps us stay organized conceptually. We know that the unordered list and list items are children or are nested within the site header nav element. We see that structure reflected in our HTML code. Why not see that structure reflected in our CSS code? And the second benefit to SAS nesting is that it saves us from a lot of unnecessary typing. So when I hit save, you see that the compiler automatically creates selectors for these different rules that make sense from a normal CSS standpoint. So I didn't need to type out site header nav for each element that we wanted to style. I only typed out site header nav once and then relied on nesting. So for example, let's target the actual link elements themselves. So A, let's make them display block, give them a bit of padding. Let's make them use a background color of orange with a text color of white. So background color, beautiful hue, color should be white. Let's remove their text underline text decoration none. Let's also add a bit of margin right to the list items. So when I save again, you see that the SAS compiler created this new rule. And again, I didn't have to type in site header nav. All I did was target the A element. And because this rule is nested within this parent rule, the compiler took care of the rest. Now let's view our changes in the browser. So if I refresh, we can see that the navigation menu looks a lot better. However, we see this content spilling up and that's because we did not clear the floats. So you will remember that we used float left on the list items. So let's go ahead and clear those floats so that our layout still works. At the bottom of our style sheet, I'm going to paste in the de facto clear fix code. So now I can add a class of group to this unordered list element and our layout is back to normal. So to review with SAS so far, we've seen variables. We just looked at nesting. We're going to transition into a new feature now named inheritance. In order to see inheritance in action, let's give ourselves a quick goal. On our example page, we have these two links that read learn more and alternate button. Now in our HTML, we can see that these are just links with a class of button A and button B. So let's write CSS so that they actually look like buttons. So first we'll begin with the button A class. So in our style sheet, I'll create a new rule and target button A. Now instead of having you watch me put together declarations for a button style, I'm just going to paste it in to save us a bit of time. So the only interesting part of this code is that I'm using the beautiful hue variable for the color of the border. So if we save and refresh in the browser, we can see that the first link looks like a button now. Now let's focus on the alternate button or the element with a class of button B. Let's imagine that we want it to look identical to the button A class, except we want it to have a unique background color. So in our style sheet, let's create a new rule for button B. Now I know that I'm going to need all of these properties from button A. The only thing that I want to change is the background color. So to leverage all of these styles, I can simply type within the rule for button B, at symbol, extend, button A. New line, background color, let's try black. So if I save and refresh in the browser, we see that button B is now styled. Now let's dissect what's going on. We were able to create that new button style in only two lines of code. Now there is no extend ability in normal CSS. So this is a SAS feature. SAS lets us type at symbol extend and then the name of a rule that we want to inherit the properties from. Now let's take a quick look at what the SAS compiler is doing behind the scenes. 
The rule for button B is simple enough, but if we look up here, the original rule for button A, we can see that the SAS compiler added a comma and then tacked on button B. So this isn't rocket science, we could do this on our own manually, but in terms of coding paradigms, it feels much more natural and enjoyable to keep things self-contained and modular. So instead of micromanaging our selectors, we can create neat, organized, self-contained rules for specific classes. We can also leverage the inheritance extendability to create cleaner HTML. So you will remember that we added a class of group to add the clearfix functionality for our top navigation. But what if we didn't want to add presentational classes to our HTML? What if we wanted to keep our HTML squeaky clean? So if I delete this class from the unordered list, we can see that our floats are not being cleared and the layout breaks. But we can use extend or inheritance on that unordered list. So I can simply type extend group. We know that the clearfix properties live within the group class. So if I save and refresh, the floats have been cleared. So in terms of how we relate conceptually to our content, for our unordered list, all we had to say was extend or inherit the clear fix properties and abilities of the group class. And then behind the scenes, the SAS compiler adjusted the selectors for the group clear fix class and added in site header nav unordered list in all of the right places. Let's take a quick time out to review what we've learned so far. We've looked at SAS variables. We've reviewed SAS nesting. We saw SAS inheritance in action. Now I want to talk about SAS's ability to break our code into smaller, neatly organized files. So for example, let's imagine that we want our style sheet to be incredibly organized. So what if we wanted any CSS code relating to our header to live in its own file? SAS makes this very simple. So I'm going to cut all of the header related code and I'm going to create a new file in our CSS folder. I'll paste in the code and I'll name this new file underscore header.scss. Now back in our full style sheet, where that code used to live, I can simply say import space, single quotes, header, colon. And when I save, we will see literally no change in the CSS that the compiler outputs. The compiler simply goes in, grabs the code from the header file, and includes it right where we told it to. This is incredibly useful because as developers, it lets us stay organized, but the web browser still receives a single CSS file, so page load speeds remain quick. Now this lesson is almost complete. We will cover more advanced topics like operators and mix-ins in our next lesson. But before we end this lesson, I wanna show you one final example of why SAS is amazing. Let's imagine that we decide button B should not use a black background, but instead should use a very light orange shade of our baseline orange color. Now, instead of using color picking software, I'm going to show you an amazing feature that SAS offers. I'm going to use a function named lighten, and I'm going to pass it two values. The first value will be our baseline orange color that we saved in the beautiful hue variable. And the second value that I will pass it is how much lighter I want the color to become. So let's try 30%. So if we refresh, that's not quite light enough. Let's try 45%. Perfect. So behind the scenes, the SAS compiler calculated the exact hexadecimal color code that would be 45% lighter than our base orange color. SAS offers all sorts of magical functions like this. So now that our style sheet uses dynamic colors that are derived from a baseline color, if we ever decide that our web page should not use orange as its main color, but instead blue, it's as simple as jumping to a color picker, choosing the exact shade of blue that we want, updating our beautiful hue variable at the top of our style sheet with the new blue value. And when we save and refresh, we see that in one foul swoop, everything is updated, and we see that this button even has a nice blue shade that is 45% lighter than the baseline blue. Now that's going to bring this lesson to a close. We will cover more advanced SAS topics in our next lesson. 
Have fun and I will see you shortly. In this lesson, we will continue learning about the features of SAS. We've saved arguably the best for last. In this lesson, we will learn about mix-ins and operators. Let's start with mix-ins. Mix-ins are incredibly powerful. They are my favorite feature of SAS. But before we dig into code, let's first give ourselves a goal. Let's imagine that we want this alternate button to use a background that is a gradient. So it fades gradually from one color to another. Now we learned earlier in the course that if we want to create a gradient with CSS code that works in almost every browser and device, we have to repeat ourselves many times. There's the old WebKit way, there's the new WebKit way, there's the Mozilla way, the Microsoft way, the Opera way, the default modern way, the old crazy Microsoft way. So that's a lot of code to write. And at the end of the day, all of those lines of code are achieving the exact same thing. They're fading from one color to another. So wouldn't it be nice if there was some sort of tool or function that could receive the two colors and then output all of those lines of code automatically? Well, we can create that tool using SAS mixins. So here we are in the text editor. We are editing our sassy CSS file and let's create our first mixin. We begin by typing the at symbol and then the word mixin. We then have a chance to name our mixin. So I will name this vertical gradient. Now, if you've ever created a function in another programming language, this is very similar. So I'm then going to type parentheses and then curly brackets. So we wanted to create a gradient. So between the curly brackets, I will say background image linear gradient begin at the top and then we can specify our colors so let's start with white and then transition to black however we likely do not want to hard code the color values into our mixin because we want our mixin to be as flexible as possible so instead of these color values of white and black let's include parameters named from color and to color. Back on this line of code, when we named our mixin within the parentheses, we will also include the parameters from color to color. Now our mixin is far from complete, but it is ready to begin testing. So let's see if we can use this mixin on the button B rule. So let's remove this background color and try to add a gradient background using our new mixin. So I will include the at symbol and the phrase include. This is how we call a mixin. So then we just type the name of the mixin that we want to use. Vertical gradient. Now when we created our mixin, we gave it two parameters. So now that we're actually calling and using the mixin, we can pass along two arguments. Or in other words, the two colors that we want to fade between. So let's say the from color should be blue and the two color should be red. So if I save and refresh in the browser, we see that I clearly made a mistake somewhere. Ah, so instead of top, this should be to bottom. So this is a great example of why we want to use a mixin for gradients in the first place. The syntax to create gradients with CSS has evolved over the years and there's different versions floating around to please different browsers and devices. So the idea is that we don't want to have to write this code every time we want a gradient. We want to be able to create one mixin, maybe every six months or every year, <laughs> and then just call the mixin whenever we need to use a gradient. So with this updated syntax in place, the code should now work in the most recent version of Firefox. So if we refresh, there's the gradient. Let's take a quick look at the CSS that the SAS compiler output. So here is the button B rule in the output CSS file. So the compiler took this include vertical gradient call and it took our arguments and it output this code. Now our mixin is not complete. So obviously outputting only one line of code is not very impressive. We could have done this on our own. So let's go and complete our mixin. We don't want it to only output one line of code for gradients. We want it to output all of those nasty, miserable to type cross browser compatibility lines so that we can have gradients in every device under the sun, even if they're terribly outdated. 
Now, instead of typing out all of those lines, which would bore both of us to death, I'm just going to paste in a chunk of code. So all this going on here is we're providing all of the different syntaxes. So here's the old WebKit way, the new WebKit way, the old Mozilla way, Microsoft Opera, the modern way, the crazy old Microsoft way. You get the idea. And instead of hard coding in color values, we use the parameters of from color and to color for all of the lines of code. So now, if I save, and we take a look at the CSS that the SAS compiler output, it's much more impressive. So all of this was created by this one line of code. We're saying include the vertical gradient mix-in and pass it arguments of blue and red. And the SAS compiler did all of this work for us. So now if we decide actually instead of blue and red, the button should have a gradient of white to orange. All we have to do in our sassy CSS file is adjust this line of code to say white and orange. And when we save, the SAS compiler re-outputs all of those nasty repetitive lines and every browser is happy. And perhaps most importantly, we as developers are happy because we only have to write one line of code. We don't need to ever look at or revisit this mix-in source code unless gradient syntax changes in major browsers. So we can reuse this mixing code in all of our website projects. And we can actually tuck it away in its own partial file and then import that. So I'm going to copy or cut this code. Let's create a new file in our CSS folder, paste in the code. Let's save this file as underscore mixins.scss. And then back in our main sassy style sheet where that code used to live, we can say at symbol import mixins semicolon out of sight, out of mind. So now we don't even need to worry and waste precious brain cells thinking about all of this disgusting cross browser code. We tuck it away in its own file, we import that file, and we can pretend that our vertical gradient mixin is just a part of native SAS language. Very quickly, I want to point out the power of combining mixins with something we learned about in our previous lesson, variables. So let's imagine we decide that this button should not use a gradient of white to orange, but instead white to a lighter shade of our baseline blue. Now we know that we're storing that baseline blue color in a variable named beautiful hue. And if we decide the baseline blue is too dark, we can use a function that we learned about in the previous lesson named lighten. Pass it the beautiful hue color and say, make it 30% lighter. So if I save and refresh in the web browser, we can see that with a single line of code, we were able to create a cross browser CSS gradient using a variable color and dynamically lighten that color by 30%. This is thanks to variables and color functions, but most importantly, this is thanks to mixins. So the gradient demo is one example of how mixins can make our life easier. Now I want to show you a second example. So let's give ourselves a new goal. Let's imagine that we want this layout to be responsive. And once we get down to about the form factor of a smartphone, we want our navigation links to sit one per line. Now we've learned about responsive web design and media queries in a previous lesson. So from a technology standpoint, we know what to do. We would head over to our header style sheet. This is where all of our header related styles live. And we would simply create a new media query, media only screen and max width of 480 pixels. And then we would target whatever element we needed to target. So in this case, the site, header, nav, list item. And in this case, we wanted them to be full width. So we would tell them to no longer be floated. We would remove the margin right. So from a technology standpoint, we know that this is how we include media queries. This is how we please the web browser. But does this please us as a developer? Is this how we want to write our style sheets? Does this code syntax make sense conceptually? Or could we use mixins to improve our experience as a coder. 
The answer is most definitely yes. Mixins can improve our media query experience. So I'm going to delete this code, head over to our mixins partial file. So here is the gradient code that we created earlier. I'm going to go to the bottom, create a comment that reads media query mixins. And let's get started on our media query mixin at symbol mixin. I'm going to name this mixin breakpoint baby bear. Within the curly brackets, I will include the code to create a media query. So media only screen and max width 480 pixels. Now again, we want mixins to be flexible. We want them to be an empty container that we pass content into later. So within this media query, I'm not going to target any elements or add any properties. I'm simply going to include the at symbol and say content. While I am still in the mixins partial file, I'm going to copy this code that we just wrote, paste it. So we're creating a second mixin and I'll give this one a name of breakpoint papa bear. And I'll change its media query condition to min width 1100 pixels. So now that we've created these two media query mixins, I'm going to head back over to our header SCSS file. And let's remember our goal was to style the navigation links so that for smaller screens, they sit one per line. So within our original baseline rule for list items in the navigation, I can simply say include, use the mixin that we just created. So breakpoint baby bear float none, margin right zero, margin bottom, two pixels. So I will save our header partial file and in our main screen sassy style sheet, I'll make sure that our import of the mixins file sits towards the top of our style sheet so that the mixins are available by the time we use them in the header file. So if we save, when we refresh, we see that our mobile styles are in place. So let's review the newfound freedom that our mixin offers us. Within the rule for the list item, we included our mixin, breakpoint baby bear. By simply nesting this mixin within the rule for the list item, the SAS compiler takes care of the rest. So you will notice that within this media query, we didn't have to select which element we wanted to style. The nesting takes care of that for us. So conceptually, this is much simpler. It feels much more natural. We're styling the list items. Here are our baseline styles. Here are our baby bear styles. Now let's imagine that for larger screens or screens that are wider than 1100 pixels, we want there to be more margin between each link. So because we created the Papa Bear mixin, it's as simple as staying within this list item rule and saying include breakpoint pop bear margin right 50 pixels. So if we save here and also save within our main sassy style sheet to trigger the SAS compiler, when we refresh, if I resize my window to be larger than 1100 pixels, we see the margin increases. Now this mix in approach of handling media queries offers two primary advantages. Number one, it centralizes our media query conditions. So conceptually, we can create different breakpoints. Baby bear is this size. Papa bear is this size. If you wanted to create mama bear as an in-between size or Goldilocks as an in-between size, that's up to you. You can have as many different breakpoints as you want. But the idea is that you're only setting these breakpoint values once within your mixin. So that when you're authoring your actual styles, you don't need to be a robot remembering these exact max width 480 or min width 1100. Instead, you can conceptually remember baby bear, papa bear, mama bear, Goldilocks, these keywords that you've defined. And then anywhere in your style sheet, you can use them. So let's imagine that we want to use a larger baseline font size for large screens and a smaller baseline font size for small screens. It's as simple as editing our HTML rule in our main style sheet. So I can say include breakpoint baby bear 
font size 0.8 em include breakpoint papa bear font size 1.4 em so when we save and refresh you can see here are the papa bear or large screen styles here are the normal styles and here are the baby bear styles so we can see the font size changes accordingly so again, the primary advantage of using mixins for media queries is that you don't need to memorize your breakpoints. You set them once in the mixin, and then you can forget about them and instead just focus on the naming scheme that you've created. The second advantage is that we can conceptually group all styles related to an element within one rule. We don't need to create completely separate media queries where we reselect the elements we want to style we can conceptually stay focused on one piece of content and style it at the different breakpoints. So this will conclude our section on mixins. Hopefully I've convinced you that they are very useful and you are hungry to use them in your own projects. Now very quickly I must point out that all of the mixins we looked at we created ourselves by hand. Now while this is certainly useful, Mixins really come alive when we realize that there's an entire community of brilliant minds creating and sharing their own mixins that you can leverage for free. There are entire SaaS frameworks bursting at the seams with powerful mixins, skeletons for variables, custom functions, and these community frameworks will make the examples that we saw in this lesson look like child's play. So if you're hungry to learn more about SaaS, I strongly encourage you to check out some of the community's top frameworks like Compass, Bourbon, and Suzy. Now, not only are these frameworks powerful and flexible, but they're also continuously updated. So for example, the frameworks will have a gradient mix-in, and if browser syntax changes so we need different code to create gradients, you don't need to worry about it. As long as you're using the framework's gradient mix-in, the community will update the framework and address the syntax changes so you can go along on your merry way using the framework's mixin as if nothing changed. So that's enough on mixins. Now let's change gears and talk about operators. More specifically, let's take a look at mathematical operators to get your feet wet. So if you've ever thought, I wish I could perform basic arithmetic in my style sheets, you're in luck. With SAS, we can. So here is a rule in our style sheet for an element with a class of box. And on our web page, that corresponds with this gray box. It currently has a width of 150 pixels. Now in elementary math, your teachers always told you to show your work. And the same applies in web design. There will be times when you're calculating the perfect width, whether it's pixels or percentages, and you don't want to end up with a value where you can't remember how you got to that value. So instead, we can include math directly in our style sheets. So we can say 100 pixels plus 200 pixels. If we save and look at the CSS that the compiler created, we see a width of 300 pixels. So addition and subtraction are pieces of cake. We can also perform division. So we could say 500 pixels divided by 2. And when you use division, you often want to make sure that you wrap it in parentheses. So if we save, the SAS compiler will return a value of 250 pixels. And the symbol for multiplication is the asterisk. So we can try 300 pixels times 2. And we see that the SAS compiler is trustworthy. <laughs> 600 pixels. Now I will let you use your imagination to think of the ways that math would be useful in your style sheets. The reason I showed you the basics here isn't so much math for the sake of math, but it's to remind you that SAS is a complete programming language. So this includes math or number operators, logical operators, control directives and expressions. There is a lot to sink your teeth into with SAS. And if you come from a programming background, or if you want to learn more about programming, there is a lot to be excited about with SAS. Now I want to point out that you don't need to wait until you're a SAS guru to begin using it in your web projects. I encourage everyone to experiment with what we've learned in these lessons. And if and when you want to learn more, check out the official sas-lang.com website or also visit 
thesasway.com. Have fun, SAS is an amazing extension language. Hello everyone, the lesson that you just watched is a snippet from my seven hour web design course. You can find a heavily discounted coupon code for the course in this video's description. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you feel like you learned something and stay tuned for more web development tutorials. Thanks, bye.